Welcome to Therapy in the Great Outdoors, a podcast about the business and practice of nature-based pediatric therapy of all kinds. If you are a nature-loving therapist who works with children, this podcast will help you start taking your work outdoors into nature and help you grow a profitable nature-based therapy practice or program that connects children to nature and changes their lives and yours forever. I'm your host, the ever honest, always 100% real, Laura Park Figueroa. I have been a pediatric occupational therapist for over 20 years, but seven years ago, I almost left the field entirely. I was so burned out. And nature-based therapy is what saved me. It reignited my love of my work, and I saw profound changes in the children that I was working with. I'm the founder of Outdoor Kids OT and the creator of the Contigo Approach, an evidence-based framework for nature-based pediatric therapy services. I've helped dozens of pediatric therapists start and grow successful nature-based practices through my business coaching and online programs, the latest of which is the Therapy in the Great Outdoors community, Tigo for short. Tigo is an online membership site with loads of resources to support you every step of the way as you start and grow your nature-based therapy work. You can find out more at therapyinthegreatoutdoors.com. Working outdoors with children can be a wild ride. Are you ready for the adventure? Let's jump in. Okay, welcome everyone to the Therapy in the Great Outdoors podcast. I'm back and I have a friend with me. I'm back after a long hiatus of doing episodes. It's been about a month or so, I think. And I'm so excited to announce that Kim Wilson is here of Nature's Path OT in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and previously in other locations, which we are going to talk about. And we're going to talk about that the topics, the reason I asked Kim to come on is because of her experience having run a nature-based practice in multiple different locations. And I think that is something that I particularly am interested in selfishly, as well as I think will be beneficial for other people to think about because I personally know therapists who are starting businesses, but maybe one day intending to move somewhere else. And we'll talk a little about your story and why you move and have moved some. And then also I want to talk with Kim about juggling it all and keeping your business small intentionally, because Kim is also the mother of six children who she homeschools. So I think everyone now knows how qualified you are to talk to us, Kim. Hi. Um, (laughs) Hello. That was, that intro was more than kind, Laura, but yes, I am a mom of six. That is correct. (laughs) <laughs> awesome. Okay. So tell everybody a little bit. I just gave that tiny intro, but I want people to know about your background a bit. Like tell them your story. Like how did you come to nature-based OT and, oh, you're an occupational therapist. I maybe should have said that. <laughs> Clearly I'm so prepared for this interview. Just, just one small detail. I am an occupational one small therapist. Detail. <laughs> so yes. I want people to hear your story. Like how did you come to nature-based OT And a little bit about your experience with your family too, because I think that ties in knowing, knowing your history a little bit personally. So yeah, definitely. So I, like you said, I'm a mom of six kids age range from my oldest is 14 and my youngest is five. And then I just have a bunch in between there. I've been an occupational therapist for 17 years now. And for, let's see, 13 of that, I have worked with pediatric population. I did a large chunk of that with early intervention, which is zero to three. I began my career with adults, neuro rehab, spinal cord and brain injury. And then when I started having my own children, I shifted to peds, which is actually very ironic because I never saw myself as a pediatric therapist. In fact, Mm -hmm. in my clinicals, I would have said that I was not the best peds therapist. I had a really hard time prior to having children, just being comfortable with children and Mm. handling children. And, you know, my clinical supervisors at that time really had to work with me on just being comfortable with like handling babies and just kind of throwing them over a therapy ball. But (laughs) the more I just started having babies and I just stepped into the early early intervention world because it was super flexible with being a mom Mm -hmm. and wanting to stay home. And so 
once I stepped into the early intervention world, I realized that it was kind of this beautiful thing of you got hooked up as an independent contractor with, you know, the state program and they would send you cases and you could kind of pick and choose like which kids you wanted to take on your caseload, how many you wanted to take on your caseload. And I literally for years just kind of like chose kids in like this certain radius around my home to where I could pop out and see kids and come back and nurse babies. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of how my journey started with going into peds. And then really shifting to nature based started in the early intervention world. I was getting frustrated with just some of these children. I just felt like some of the issues could just be resolved if they just got outside more. And so Mm -hmm. then it just dawned on me of why am I not taking these kids outside? Like I can do this because early intervention is in the child's natural environment. So you can treat them in the home, you can treat them in a school and daycare, and you can treat them outside. And so I started taking kids outside well before I actually started my private practice. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how, and so nature's path OT is only about a year and a half old officially, but I've been doing nature-based therapy for well before that, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me where, where were you when you started nature's path OT and where are you now? So I was in, yes. So I was in, so my husband's in the military, so I, I'll put that out there. That that's why we kind of have a transient life. So I've lived in five different locations. And so when we were living in Louisiana and I was doing early intervention there and I was taking kids outside there. And then mm-hmm. we found out that we were moving to Montana and everywhere I went, I just always just kind of got hooked up in the early intervention system. Like it was mm easy. I say that very lightly when I say easy, because there's obviously all the paperwork you have to do and all of that stuff to just get hooked up as an independent contractor. But it was just kind of like everywhere I went, I knew I might not be here for long. And so it was just an easy way for me to start seeing kids right away. But when we shifted to Montana, their earlier intervention program is kind of interesting. And I'll just leave it at that. But (laughs) I had I had always I think the dream of having my own practice to take with Mm -hmm. me had always been there. And if I'm being honest, I think that the very thing that is beautiful about having this thing that I can take with me anywhere was what prevented me from doing it from so for so long, because I just kept Mm -hmm. thinking to myself, like, I don't want to put in all this work if I'm just going to have to like uproot and just leave it all. But now having lived it and done it, it's kind of, a really beautiful thing to put in the work and build the business side of it and be able to take it with you wherever you go now that I've experienced that. So that was in Montana. And Mm -hmm. really, I started in Montana just to work on the nuts and bolts of business because that is not my strength. I would say Mm -hmm. the clinical side is my strength and the entrepreneurship. I was kind of like, didn't have a clue. So I my intention there was just to work on that side of things, even if patients and kids didn't come to fruition. I was going to put in the time there to just do the nuts and bolts of the business and learn all the stuff that I didn't know how to do, like a website and all of that stuff. And then I just started getting kids on my caseload. And so it kind of came to fruition there, which was awesome. And now we've been in Colorado Springs for the past five months. So I just recently relocated with Nature's Path. So I have kind of that experience now of does this really work? Like does the idea of having this business and kind of taking it with you somewhere else, there's obviously a lot of pros to it being nature-based because we don't have to worry about brick and mortar and finding a space and all of those elements that I don't really have to worry about. But now I have kind of the experience of my belt of like, it actually does work and it's kind of cool to see it come to fruition. So Yeah. Okay. I want to go back. So I have so many questions. I want to go back to the thing you just said about, I was working on the nuts and bolts of the business, but then I started to get kids on my caseload. I got like families interested. How do you think you got those families interested? How did that happen? How did the first people find you? I would say a hundred percent in all of my experience, it would be word of mouth. So Mm -hmm. I just got really comfortable with talking about it, (laughs) like talking Mm -hmm. about it. And I will say it was helpful. 
every location is different. So I can only speak to you, Laura, you and I have talked a little bit about this, about shedding some light on there's going to be places that are easier to do this than others, especially when you're cash based. Yeah. But I was actually nervous about doing it in Great Falls, Montana, being a cash based provider because of the demographics there. It's a small community. It's, it's only like 52 or 53,000. So it's not a very big town. Okay. I would say it's more kind of blue collar. Like I just didn't know if, but I, I went into it, not really putting expectations on getting kids right away, like just building mm-hmm. the nuts and bolts. But what's also really cool about a smaller town is word of mouth kind of flies pretty quickly, right? So interesting. When you, when you are in a small town, you kind of people just start to talk. And so my first kid that I got on my caseload was actually just kind of word of mouth, like through my friend who knew this person and mm-hmm. took, a, took a bar class with this mom who had this child in <laughs> needed services, that type of thing. And yeah. that's kind of how it came to be. Every single one of my kids was word of mouth in Great Falls, Montana. And so, and then I'm also seeing that same thing come to fruition here in Colorado Springs, word of mouth. Okay. Laura, you, I feel like you have more of like the business empire side of things. I love how you said like keeping it small because that's definitely my niche, I guess you could say is like, I keep things smaller, but I, as far as marketing goes, because I'm keeping it small, I I don't spend a lot of time on marketing. Like I just, it's word of mouth Mm -hmm. really a hundred percent of the time for me. And in large part, I mean, I, I don't have to build a huge caseload because I'm not interested in working 40 hours a week. Right. So there's a little bit of the pressure's taken off a little bit and I don't have to build this huge caseload of 40 hours a week. I personally right now don't have employees where I need to fill their caseload. Right. So there's that element where, for me in my season of life, it's pro- it probably is a little easier just because I'm I'm not interested in getting all yeah. the kids. Do you know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. Well, and also I there's so many little nuggets that I just want to draw people's attention to here that, you know, you're really starting with your own vision of your values and your lifestyle, right? Yes. I, I say all the time, like we have to create businesses that serve us as well as serve our clients, or we're going to burn out and not be able to serve our clients. And so you're thinking about like, what's my life like right now? And you're homeschooling six children that is over a full-time job right now. And so you're, you're purposefully saying, I don't want to take on Mm -hmm. this. Like, like my business is not going to be my full-time job right now. Your full-time job is homeschooling your children. (laughs) You're a teacher first or a mother, a mother and teacher first. So how many kids, I think this would be helpful to people too, just from your experience, keeping it small because of your other commitments that are your priority right now. How many kids do you feel like is the sweet spot for you feeling like you can manage? I mean, homeschooling six kids in general, I wouldn't be able to run a business. Like I... (laughs) I think I honestly, I'm, I'm so envious of you. And I, I want to say this for the record on the podcast that I, I have homeschooled two of my three children at short periods of yeah. time for COVID, obviously for part of it. Cause we pulled our son out of school. He was not doing well with, with zoom seven hours a day or however much they were yeah. supposed to be on there. And my middle child homeschooled for a year and a half or, or close to two years in middle school. But that, but that being said, it was one child at a yeah. time that I was homeschooling. Yes. <laughs> I don't call myself a homeschooler. And I'm a little envious, honestly, of people who who have orchestrated their lives to be able to homeschool their kids. Because now as an adult with my youngest being 12, right? And my older two are yeah. out of the house. In some way, I'm like the old lady who's like looking back going like, I wish I had had more time with them. I wish I had, you know, and this is not to say that everybody needs to homeschool or anything no. like that, but I do admire families now, like I look at families like yours and I admire families that orchestrate their lives in order to have that time to be able to home educate their children, because it, I don't think it's, maybe it's not my personality anyway to, to be able to have done it. But I also, I also think it's such a beautiful thing to have that time and a valuable thing that you'll never get back those years, you know? So it's like, I understand the priorities and I also wonder how you do it. I'm I'm yeah. so interested what number you're going to say for how many kids yeah. o- on caseload you can have for your nature-based practice. So yeah, I'll well, stop I talking. Love, Go. <laughs> no, I love that you asked that question because early on, I spent a lot of time contemplating that of, mm-hmm. because 
I would say I hyper focus on keeping margin in my life because once I don't have margin, I'm just not healthy. Like I just, I don't yeah. like, I don't like how I feel with not feeling like I'm, I'm spending the time. I, if I'm going to commit to homeschooling my children, like but that's a commitment that I need to take seriously. Like that's not a commitment that I, if I'm not going to be able to do it, how I need to do it, like I need to send them to school. Do you know what I mean? Like that, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's, that's a reality. And so I, I don't do well when I feel like I'm not doing that piece well in my life, because I feel like mm. that's just out of respect for them and their education. Yeah. Like just because yeah. I want to pursue other things, it doesn't mean that I should ever let that priority go to the wayside. Like that's mm-hmm. just, that's just something that I've always committed. So early on in starting nature's path, I spent a lot of time really figuring out like how many is that going to be like how many kids is that going to be and because I also don't only do individual OT but I have my developmental progression baby classes and so oh yeah we didn't talk about that tell people a tiny bit about that but I do want to hear the numbers too of how many kids you got overwhelmed at okay so (laughs) I see kids for individual OT And then I have my developmental baby classes and where that came from, that was kind of birthed in Montana because I was also nervous about stepping into nature-based practice, worried about losing that zero to three population. Cause I have a heart, Mm -hmm. I have a heart for babies and I have a heart for like the mom baby dyad. And so knowing that I had been in the early intervention world and earlier intervention services are available to families, I knew that that might be a population that might be hard to kind of grab with like a cash-based service and baby outside. And so I got a little, I don't know if it was nervous, but a little sad in my heart of like, yeah, if I, if I go this way in nature-based practice, like, am I going to lose these babies? Cause I love babies. And so then I kind of, then that was where the idea was birthed of, you have a heart for the mom baby dyad why don't we, why don't you just try these developmental progression classes where it's more of a preventative approach? Like these kids aren't, these kids aren't necessarily qualifying for services. Although there have been some babies within my classes where I saw something and I kind of recommended and then I, they turned into maybe an OT kid of mine, but it was more of a preventative approach of let's equip and empower moms of developmental milestones, how you can set up you know, play spaces to encourage them meeting developmental milestones, because the reality is the research out there supports that a lot of moms feel unequipped, especially in that first year of life. And so I was running my developmental um, progression classes as well. That's where that started in Montana. And I haven't in Colorado started those back up because again, every time I go somewhere, I'm very careful to kind of keep my margin and just kind of like slowly build back up to kind of reach that like gauge of where am I at? Like constantly asking myself, are you doing okay? So to go back to your question though, I have found (laughs) after really thinking through and really pondering for me personally with feeling like I can homeschool my children. Well, that would include five full-time OT kids Mm -hmm. at a complete package because I have two different packages as well, which are more more time consuming because I my complete package includes my home program boxes, which I'm giving to families. And I spend a lot of time kind of curating those and coming up with activities for those. And so those are more time intensive. So five full-time complete package OT kids, and then two developmental baby classes, which may not seem like, like a lot to somebody who's working in the clinic at 40 hours, but that's where my threshold is of where I feel like I can still yeah. maintain, maintain margin. Um, at least that, in, individually as me being the sole provider within my practice. Yes. And that sounds like a lot to me, honestly. Okay. Like, okay. because when you think, when you think about like the time involved in even marketing, you know, the, yes. the services, I mean, I know you said you don't have to market so much when you only want five or whatever, but for a class, like for, for the baby yes. classes, right. Yeah. Like, and maybe those sell quote unquote, a little easier because they're lower priced because they're enrichment Absolutely. classes, but, yep. but yeah, just the coordinating of it, the getting the word out about it, the managing the space and setting up for it. I mean, I think that's a lot. I thought you were going to say like, I thought five would be your number. That was my guess of, of how many kids, Okay, but without the baby classes even being well, factored so in. I was, I was so. actually just talking to somebody about this today. Cause my baby classes, I found because it's a group format, 
And because I just, I'm equipped with babies. Like I've had six babies of my yeah. own and, I, and the knowledge is just, and, and it's, it's, it's generalized information, right? It's not individualized mm-hmm. treatment. So uh, the baby classes are quite actually easy. I have found like, those are interesting. Those aren't what's taking up my time. Like, because I just have the kind of knowledge bank in my head and I'm not spending a lot of time, which I've actually thought of you many times in this, Laura, because you preach like system, system, systems. And I have kicked myself multiple times because I ran these baby classes with just kind of like my knowledge bank of like, Mm. and they, it, it has gone well and people have liked them, but I've like thought on multiple occasions because there's been interest in like people wanting to do it. And even like people interested in like purchasing the program to be able to just implement on their own. And I'm like, why have I not written this all down? (laughs) I'm like, I'm totally laughing because as you were talking about it, I was like, she needs to make a curriculum. She needs to sell this. Someone needs to. (laughs) Yes. And I know, and I know I need to do that. But again, coming back to margin of like, just yeah, having time in certain seasons and there will be a season where I'll be able to sit down and be able to like get it all down on paper and maybe, you know, utilize that as another income source of being able to sell it to other therapists and be a resource. But right now that just wasn't kind of in, you know, yeah, I didn't. Well, and I, I want to say too, like, I, I joke about that, but I also want to say for the record that you can create a digital product, but it takes time and energy to sell a digital product. The, a, a common belief that I still like, believe the lie sometimes that if you just create something, if you build it, they will come, right? No, like, no, you, you have to market it. You have to sell it. You have to constantly be talking about it. You have to show people that it's valuable. You have to have the market for it. You have to have an email list for it. You have to, there's a lot of, of like background stuff that I think we don't think about when it comes to online business. We think, well, I'll just create this digital product as an additional revenue source and everything will be great. And it's like, well, yes, it's great to have an additional revenue source, but also I think creating that additional revenue source should be beneficial for your practice itself. Right. And the the reason I think the reason I think it's good, it would be good for you to make it into, sorry, I'm going into like business coachy mode here. I didn't mean to do this, (laughs) but it's just such an interesting topic. But like, I, I think the reason that I was thinking in my brain, like she needs to write this down. It could be a curriculum is because that enables you to grow your business, right? Like at the first level, the first level before you even sell it to anyone else is like, use it in your own practice just so that you can hire someone and say, here's what you need to do, especially for enrichment classes. Cause you can do that. The hard thing with therapy is, you know, new therapists all the time in my business and other nature-based practices have told me this, that they hire people and that, you know, nature-based therapy is like, it's new. When you get out there, it's like, not like working in a clinic. Right. (laughs) So a lot of times new therapists will be like, well, I wish you could just give me a curriculum for like eight weeks. And it's like, well, therapy is not really a curriculum. Like even when you run a group, it's hard to do a curriculum because each group is so different. And really as a therapist, you're trying to meet the needs of the kids that are individually in that group for their goals. And so it makes sense to me what you were saying that like the baby groups to me as someone who I worked in earlier mentioned years ago and did a little work in the NICU, but like not, not like for the years that you did for me running a baby group would be like, oh my gosh, I have to like completely refresh my memory. Like I, but for you, it's like taking what you already know. And this is what I hope will encourage listeners to think about like what you already know and love. Like you could literally just do it off the top of your head. You don't even have to really plan something. You could go into a group of moms and babies and run a developmental group with no problem. That's what you should be doing in your business, right? Yes. It's so easy and it it makes work feel fun. So yes, yes. And I want to add on to that, Laura, because I just had this conversation with an OT who's also like thinking about pursuing nature-based practice. And Mm -hmm. There's so much wisdom and things that, you know, you educate people on about like market research and like, where are you at? Who's your population? What Mm. are the needs? There is so much wisdom in that. But also I would add to that before you ask yourself that, and before you get too hooked on, like to what the needs of the population are, like what's being laid on your heart that you have a passion for. Cause that's how my mom baby Mm. classes started was like, I was really wanting to just not lose that population because I loved that mom baby dyad. And I really believed wholeheartedly that 
there was a need for it. Like whether if I did the market research for Great Falls, Montana, and it told me so, like I knew in my heart that like, this is needed. Like moms need to be supported. They need, mm. and, and that was from real life experience of being a mom of six kids. Like I knew that like you need community and you need support and you need somebody to just tell you you're doing a good job. Like you're doing awesome and you're a good mom. And so that's where that started for me. I didn't, I didn't look to see whether there was a need for it. I just had a heart for it. And so I want to add on to that of just like, when I, wherever you are, wherever you're planted, whatever location, like mm-hmm. start there of like, what do you have a passion for? Like what really gets you energized? Because like I said, like my mom, baby classes are, those are easy. I could probably do five to 10 of those a week because <laughs> it's just like, I have a heart for it and it's just my knowledge bank and I can do it mm-hmm. easily. And there isn't so much that even the side of like, you know, I don't have to worry about notes. I'm not sending home individualized treatment plans for each baby. Like I'm just providing right. education. So those are easy, but it's the time consuming are my individual OT kids really. So, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about how, so your first kids when you were in Montana came from word of mouth and you getting comfortable talking about what you were doing. This is something I want everyone to hear yes. because even I, str- people will be surprised at this, but I really struggled with this when I first started in California, my, my nature-based practice, like people would ask about it. And I'd be like, well, it's, we just, we do all our work outside. And we, you know, like me, <laughs> like super confident, like I'm always like loud and opinionated and I'm like, oh, I'm scared of everyone. I don't yes. want to tell them about my new business, you know? So it it is like a process of getting comfortable and and feeling so confident, like communicating confidently the confidence that you can help people, right? Yes. Like in those conversations that you have at barbecues or at church or like out in your neighborhood or wherever you are at your kid's school, like wherever you may be, like really communicating that you have a solution and you want to help people, I think is what to focus on to yes. get over your kind of fear of saying you have a business and that you are going to make money in the business. We all have this like shame around money that needs to be done away with. But so, yeah, I think that confidence of talking about it. Yeah. And it's, I feel like it, the more you do it, the easier it gets. I remember the first time I ever sat down with a family, the the cash based model really was awkward for me and really hard for me. I felt like the sales side of it, I really felt uncomfortable with just because that wasn't my my strength. And I remember that first sit down meeting with a family and just, I I was so nervous and it was hard. It was super Mm -hmm. hard for me. And I want people to hear that of like, it's not easy that first time, but like, you just have to step into it and you have to do it. And then I was literally shocked. Like when I got the email saying that they wanted to proceed with services, because I thought there's, there's no way they're going to want to do this. Like there's no way, but I was shocked. Like, and ever since then, it's just gotten easier and easier because I think then you just realize as families are communicating to you, like the value in it. And as you're seeing Mm -hmm. the impact of it, even though you knew it, I knew that, but like then when you're actually doing it and you're seeing families and it's working, like it works. That's why I keep saying it just works. And, <laughs> and so it gets easier and easier. And then I want to add on to Laura about what you talked about, about like just talking about it. And I'm not just talking about like you seeing someone who has a child who you're like, wow, that child could definitely use some of my services and approaching them in that manner. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> talking, talking about like, even just people who like it, it's not, they're not even, you know, in a space where they would utilize your services. They may not even right. have kids or they might, but just right. when you talk about something that you're passionate about and they see that, like yeah. I'm getting families from, oh, well, so-and-so told me about you or so like, it wasn't even maybe people I had direct conversations with, right? It was just someone yeah. I had it, where it's like people see your passion and they see that you love what you do. And then word of mouth just kind of yeah. goes a long way. Exactly. Like that's like you're at the gym and someone's like, oh, what do you do? And you're like, oh, actually, I run a local nature based occupational therapy practice. We work with kids with autism and ADHD. We see them all outdoors. We don't do anything inside. Like, yes, even in winter. I love it. It's so fun. Like when they hear you talk about that, like, in that way, it it's, it's like memorable because it's different in some way for, for yes. most of us, I think in most of our areas for people that are listening and for you and I, like nature-based practice is not like the total norm. You know, they know of the big pediatric clinics in the areas, yes. but they don't 
they they probably most likely have not heard of someone doing therapy outdoors with kids. So it's memorable. And that's when like they they have a friend at the barbecue they go to on Friday who's talking about their kids challenges at school or whatever it is. And yep. you don't know. You don't know the power of those like word of mouth kind of moments or whatever. It's so yeah, it's it's interesting. So so talking about it, not yeah, like not to people necessarily yeah. that would even use your services. It's just like awareness in the community of your services. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you moved, that's what I want to talk about. So did you keep like, are you doing telehealth with any of your clients from Montana or did you kind of like break ties with that whole area and move fully into Colorado Springs? How did that go? No, like simplistically, no. And we've talked a little bit about this of when you develop, you know, rapport and relationships with someone I found mm -hmm. when I left Montana, every single one of my families wanted to know that like, there was the option to continue to reach out to me. Like when mm -hmm. you, when families just want to know that, you know, they were respectful if I wanted to cut ties, but they also, that right. was on the forefront of their brain of like, is there an option for, you mm -hmm. know, us reaching out to you if we need help or whatever. And so that's been interesting to navigate, which we've talked about just, you know, being in different states. And that's also happening with, we were in Louisiana before that. And although I wasn't, didn't have my private practice in Louisiana, I had a lot of connections there of friends who now are having maybe some challenges with some of their kids and just need help. And so they know that I'm doing this. And so they've also reached out to me. So yeah. So your first kid that you got in Colorado Springs, how did that happen? Same word of mouth. Yep. Word of mouth. And I will. So I do want to put this out there because I do think this is important. I don't want to paint also an unrealistic picture for people because yeah, Colorado Springs is my hometown. So I grew, I grew up in Colorado Springs. I, uh, went, okay. Okay. So I know a lot of people in Colorado Springs. So I just want to mm -hmm. be transparent with that of, um, I feel like this move was probably easier for me than Montana. Cause I yeah. went to Montana. I started this and I didn't know anybody in Montana. Like it was literally like, right. People didn't know my face from the next person, you know? Right, right. So it has been easier with this transition just because I have, I know more people. And so word of mouth is even easier. My first patient was in that route of, yeah. Like word of mouth from people who knew you. Yeah. Correct. yeah. But, but it, it speaks to the value of just building relationships, really. I mean, we've been in Madison for a year and a half now. And anytime I tell people what I do, I, I tend to say I still run a nature based. I talk about it, but it's like in California. Right. right. And everybody's question is, when are you going to start here? Oh, my gosh. I have people I work as a psychologist at whatever. Like people are very supportive. You know, they want to get kids the help yes. that they need. The struggle for me, it's like we've said about the cash thing is where I came from in the Bay Area was a very like there's just a lot of wealth there. It's one yes. of the wealthiest areas in the country. Right. And which made it very difficult to live there. And yet also very easy to start a private practice there yes. because the yeah. the cultural norm is that people pay cash for occupational therapy services for their children. Wow. And it's yeah. it's like a cultural norm there, right? And so I, I we talked a little bit about this before we hit record, but let's repeat the conversation for the people listening here yes. <laughs> to benefit yeah. them. I feel like, you know, it's just I have heard business coaches in the therapy space say, you can start a cash-based practice anywhere and it doesn't matter where you live. And I I agree, I agree that you can start a cash-based practice anywhere. And also at the same time, it is not as easy in some areas as it is in others, if we're just going to be a hundred percent frank and honest. Right. And so now I live in Madison, Wisconsin. I do still have my practice in California, but when I think about starting to see kids here, I was telling Kim before we hit record that I went in some Facebook groups recently to kind of look at, you know, just, just in order. One of the things I often recommend to people is join the Facebook groups for parents in your area and just be helpful. Yeah, like, don't try absolutely. to talk about your business. Just say, I'm a local pediatric occupational therapist. If they're interested, they'll click on your little name and they'll go and see your business, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and maybe contact you, but you, you just go in and be helpful. And so I went into these groups with the intention of doing that. 
And sure enough, in the last month, there's probably three or four posts about my child has anxiety and this happened at school and how should I respond? Or, you know, my kid just got diagnosed with ADHD and I'm looking for OT, like specifically mentioning OT. And in all of the conversations, there were multiple comments about, you know, some people pay out of pocket for cash based services, but this is you know, they didn't say horrible, but the vibe was like, kind of like, yeah. this is so unfair and should never be, should never be, you know, it was just kind of this vibe of that, that made me a little bit wary of like gotcha. putting mm-hmm. myself out there as like, I'm only taking cash. I'll stop. I'm, I'm wondering if you've run into any of this or if you have any advice for people about so, getting over that a little bit because I have is, thoughts, but I want you to share. That I can share my experience. My experience mm-hmm. is almost every single child that I've gotten on my caseload has been a child who has been kind of in the hamster wheel of OT services. And I say hamster wheel of OT services. And what I mean by that is they have received services for maybe an extended length of time. And yeah. families are have just gotten to this point where they're sick of it. They're sick of like, not the yeah. individual. I'm not, and I'm not saying, I want to be very clear here. I'm not saying that all clinic services aren't individualized yeah. or they don't make time for their patients. I'm not saying that, but almost every single child that I've gotten on my caseload has been families who have kind of reached this point where they want more, they want more individualized treatment. They want some, they want an alternative treatment model because yeah. they just haven't seen the results that they've wanted and they're ready to try something new because they haven't seen it. And so that has been my experience. And so I would say, you know, those families who are maybe making the comments, I can't believe that, you know, maybe they just haven't experienced that, that, that yet, you know, maybe they just haven't yeah. been into the six, 12, 18 months of therapy and they just have hit this wall and they want to see more progress. And so that I want to that I want to throw that out there that that's been my personal experience that parents are wanting more than the 5 minute recap after a session where they feel like they're going home mm-hmm. unequipped because they don't really understand what's happening or and they they want kind of a personal OT is really what my experience yeah. has been and they are okay with paying more for it because they they see value in that mm-hmm. if that makes sense I think too, another thing to highlight is for, for people listening in your marketing, if you are choosing to be a cash-based practice, one thing you can highlight in your marketing is that it might take less time to see yes. progress. It might actually, yes. you might actually be in therapy for less time than you would in an insurance-based model where it's kind of like you get your 30 minutes or your 60 minutes a week, and then you're in and out and there's no communication with the therapist outside of the sessions or anything like that. Because I, I really do feel like the, the and again, I will say too, I know nature-based practices that are taking insurance and they yeah. are phenomenal therapists. Like yeah. this is nothing against, it's it's a matter of like business model, right? Absolutely. Like how are you setting yep. up your business for financial stability? So you can do that. You can set up your practice that way. But the advice that I got from a business coach, when I moved to Madison, I actually reached out to Brandon Siegel to give me some advice because I was thinking about like setting up, taking insurance and stuff here just because the market being different. Yeah. Right. And one of the things he said was, you know, insurance makes sense for a large scale kind of a lot of clients, right? You have to have the volume in order yes. to make insurance make sense because of the biller that you have to pay to get your money. And then you're also getting reimbursed less money, right? So there's yeah. all these added costs to taking insurance that kind of aren't really thought about upfront. But yeah. And so he he kind of said to me, if you're keeping it small, even if you're even if it's you and a couple of other therapists, like he's like, you don't you don't need to take insurance. And also you need to think about it. It's not really the way that you're practicing is not really under a medical model, like what right. you're doing. And this was so helpful to me. It was like thinking about it, like we're a little bit outside. Yes, we're a medical quote unquote therapy, but the way in which we're delivering services, for example, doing a two hour long group with four kids, like yeah. you can't get reimbursed from insurance for doing that. They reimburse like $7 per child for a group or something yeah. You know, for yeah, absolutely. 97150 or whatever the group code is. So there's things that you can highlight, I think, in your marketing that that illustrate to families the value they're getting 
because it's not something that insurance would reimburse for, Absolutely. right? Like you can work on goals that, that insurance would not necessarily reimburse for. Like yes. that's just the reality. There's some goals that they're not going to reimburse for. So. I actually just, it's, it's a hundred percent true, Laura. I actually just wrote a post on this of, can you imagine I was talking about just sitting in the quiet and the research that is emerging mm-hmm. about like quietness and it literally like regenerates the brain. And I talked about, can you imagine if I submitted to an insurance company, child sat in the quiet for 15 minutes, smelling flowers, like they would be like, uh, but I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to back down on the therapeutic benefit of that. Like there is right. a therapeutic benefit in that. And it, you, it's just hitting on exactly what you just said of like, there's just things that the insurance company company would not reimburse and whether it's currently supported with the research, like they don't care. And so, yeah, I just wanted to add on to that. So. Yeah. Cause under insurance, you really do have to do what they say to do in order yeah. to get paid. You you have Absolutely. to only work on medically necessary goals. And the reality is that like a lot of social emotional goals aren't, aren't even considered quote unquote medically necessary for children, even though we know like for their mental Which health, is- it is so necessary. Like it, it's, it's crazy to me. We could go down a huge oh, we rabbit could hole totally here. Go down that. <laughs> but I want to add on to what you said of, I found that very helpful. And this might be a little nugget that somebody listening might just want to hear. When I do my initial consults with families, I do feel like that piece of me saying to them, I am not inter- I'm very like upfront about, I am not interested in seeing your child for years upon years upon years. Like that is not the goal that I'm trying to yeah. accomplish. Like, and that's why I do package sessions. Like you're, you're purchasing 10 sessions and I, that holds us both accountable. I really feel like of we have yeah. 10 sessions and we are going to get as much out of these 10 sessions as we possibly can. And then we'll reevaluate, but I have n- no desire to just be seeing your child upon years, upon years, upon years, because that's not the end goal. The end goal is to equip you as parents to be the mm-hmm. primary therapist. And I do feel like that is like a weight lifted from the families, maybe because the families I'm seeing have just kind of been in kind of the hamster wheel of years of services and they're just kind of, yeah. they're sick of it. And so it's like a weight is lifted of like, yes, like this is what we want. Like we want these kind of more intense services where we're not doing this for years and years and years, but we're walking away from it, feeling empowered yeah. and equipped. Yeah. Well, and thinking of that's like a, a rhythm of life, right? Like the seasons of life. Like I, I do feel like there's a tendency in OT in particular. And I don't know if it's like this. I know this, this podcast, I mean, let's be real. Most, most people listening are probably OTs because I'm an OT, but the intention of this podcast is support like mental health therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists. Like, I don't know if this is the same in other professions, but I do feel like the tendency is to, once a kid's on your caseload, it's just kind of this unknown sort of like, when are we going to be done? And parents probably love the clarity that you're giving them of like 10 sessions, a check-in, yes. 10 sessions, another check-in, you know, so that there's there's a sense of like, we are going to revisit. We know we're in for 10 sessions, but after that, we can kind of reassess and, and decide if we're yes. going forward. Because it, it's just not, it's just not healthy for kids to be in therapy no. for that long. It like fosters a dependence that I don't know is, is really... Well, yeah. And I, I have worked in the clinic and I'm just going to be real too, of when I talk about like, it holds us both accountable, both family and therapists. Like Mm -hmm. when you work in the clinic and you're accepting insurance and you get the, after that initial evaluation, you get the initial approval for, you know, three months of OT or six months of whatever it is, or however many sessions you have the approval of those many sessions. And so if one of those sessions kind of goes, you're like, eh, like, I'm just kind of half in it right now. Like it's, there Mm -hmm. is an element to that because I have lived it. I've worked in that setting and it is a very different feeling when I know that I have 10 sessions with this kid. And if we, I'm making an impression on that family, right? Like if we do need another 10 sessions to hit what we need, like they're not going to do it if I'm not busting my tail for them for those 10 sessions. And so there's this kind of accountability it holds therapists to as well, where it's just not like Mm -hmm. all these sessions are given to you by the insurance company. It's like, so I just wanted to add that to it. Yeah. Oh, it's so true. It came up in my research. Actually, a lot of people said, and I, I had to like reword things to make it not seem as 
quote unquote negative to the committee. But <laughs> but a lot of people said that they're pre this is nature based therapist only. So they are a biased sample. I had to like clearly write like yeah. clearly the sample is biased. I'm only talking to nature based therapists here. But a lot of people mentioned in previous jobs in the clinic that they felt like they had access to so many supplies and so much equipment that it was just like kind of relying on autopilot, like autopilot, they just kind yeah. of rely on the equipment, the same thing they do. They do the same thing kind of over and over, but that nature offers this like ever changing environment that like you literally don't know you can plan something, but it's not yep. going to go that way, you know? Absolutely. So like that was one of the things in the research that came up was like, operating on autopilot was something that many people experienced in the indoor setting. And that's not to say, again, like, I feel like we need to be very clear. Although if you're listening to this podcast, maybe you won't be offended by any of this, but like, (laughs) but like, really, I mean, there's useful work goes on in clinics all over the world. Like it's not to, it's not to say that that work isn't valuable. It's just different. And some people that love the outdoors want to take their work outdoors with children and and then experience these benefits and like kind of see things that they didn't see before when they were working indoors yes. only with kids. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Something I want to talk about too, Laura, because I know we talked about just like keeping it small of, I feel like mm-hmm. something I want just to be heard and to hold space for, for anybody listening is that I feel like at least for my personality for a long time, what prevented me of stepping into this is me feeling like I couldn't do it a hundred percent to the degree that I, Mm. I had imagined in my head that I wanted to do it like a business empire. Let's just call it that. And I feel like for a a lot of years that prevented me from stepping into Mm -hmm. it because I was, I, I was in this season where I kept telling myself like, not yet, not yet. I'm my primary role is homeschooling my kids. My prim- this mm-hmm. is where I need to be at, not yet. And I want, I've been more vocal with other therapists that I've talked to who are maybe moms. And I feel like that really is kind of more my audience now because people see that in me of like doing both. And yeah. I love that because I feel like I learned a lot of things that I, w- I would have stepped into it much sooner. I wanted people to hear that, like, yeah, just do it. Cause I, I, I waited too long and now I'm like, Oh, why did I wait so long? And if you struggle with that personality of not wanting to do it because you don't think you can do it a hundred percent to the degree that you think you should be doing it, I would just encourage you to think about like, now that I'm doing it, I'm doing it a hundred percent to the degree in which I can do it right now in yeah. my season of life. Does that make sense? Like yeah. I, I've had to play with like, where's my margin? How, but once I found that I can do it to a hundred percent of my ability in that right now, if I right. went beyond that, things might <laughs> tinker out a little bit, but also <laughs> what I want to what, what I want people to hear is I feel like for a long time, I believe the lie that if you're only seeing five kids and only doing two baby classes, like you, you don't hold as much weight as somebody who, you know, has built this amazing business, you know, empire and whatnot. I think I believe that lie for a little bit. And so I want people to hear of like you, if you are doing it part-time, if you're only seeing one kid, if you're only seeing, you know, three kids, like you are having a profound impact and you are use, utilizing your skills as an OT. And not only that, but it is more than a hobby. Like what I'm doing, it may seem small, but I am contributing financially. Like I am bringing in yeah. finances and I am contributing financially. Yeah. It's not as much as it would be for if I was doing 40 hours a week, but right. I am, I am contributing financially and I am making impact in these families' lives and these kids' lives. Yeah. And so it does not have to be this large scale business. And what's amazing is like when I am in a season where I can step out into something bigger, like I have done a lot of the footwork right now that will make it easier for me to do that. Yeah. You're ready to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I I laugh because when you say like huge business empire, I'm like, I've never had that. And I've coached people how to do business. I mean, my my practice literally just this year, seventh year in business, just hired my first full-time employee. So like, right. you know, it it's it's funny. I think sometimes yeah. when 
when we see stuff on, so like, I see what you're doing and I'm like, oh my gosh, like her content is so great on social media. Like it's the tendency to like, see what other people are doing okay. and think that they're doing so much more than we are or whatever. Yeah. And I think we all could use like a healthy dose of reality to know that like, yes not, I don't know, like just that, that comparison is so hard. Right. And, and to think, I mean, to hear you talk, I'm like, to think of you not being in like the nature-based therapy peds community. Like I, I just, it's like, you're such a gift to this community. And I'm like, we would not know you if you had not done this. I'm just, I'm so, so thankful that you did it. And also just want to reiterate and agree completely with what you said that like, you don't have to have this no. massive practice that makes like a million dollars a year. I mean, that no. takes a lot. I, I actually have done the math of what a million dollar a year practice would be. And it's like something like, oh, I'm going to say it all wrong. I think it was something like 20 group. Like my practice focuses mostly on groups. We just sit, we see right. a few individual kids, but it was something like 40 groups going all year long or something like that. And we're at like yeah. nine right now, you know, or 25 groups going. I mean, it was like so many and like yeah. to, to actually scale. And when I looked at the logistics of that, like the logistics of like, actually, what does that mean? Like, what does yeah. that mean in the business? Like how many more therapists would I need? How many more volunteers, students, paid group assistants? Like we have people that are helping with groups now. I don't know if I want to run a business that big. Like yeah. that's, that's not like, like, I don't know if that's what I want to do. Right. I love yeah. business coaching. I love, I love teaching. Like there's, there's other things that I love writing. There's a lot of other things I want to do to serve like the nature-based therapy community of pediatric therapists. And I think that like, just thinking about like what you do well and like knowing yes. you don't have to be like what everybody else is doing is so important. It's just such a, such a valuable message you just shared because I think we all, all of us struggle with it. Like yeah. I struggle with being jealous of like nature-based practices online. I'm like, wait a second. They're not my competition. Why am I jealous of them? You know, like, that's <laughs> right. 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 Like, I yeah. mean, I'm just being honest here. Like it, it's, it's totally like you see what other people you're like, oh my gosh, that's like a brilliant idea for like that small group activity they did was so great. Why didn't I think of that? You know, like we yeah. immediately go into this, like, like, or at least I do. I, no, I hope I'm it's true. not no, unlike it's true. other people, but <laughs> no, 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 it's true. It's true. I think that's the major pitfall, especially of social media. But I also think that if we can just focus on, and this is what really helped me is that especially with whatever community you're planted in, like, like I said, like yeah. whatever is laid on your heart, like, and that's really what gave me the push to just step into it of like, is, if there's just one family, like if there's just one yeah. family that I could impact in my little small corner of Great Falls, Montana, like it would be worth it to me. Right. Like, and yeah. so, and that's how it started. And I think if you can go into it with that mindset and obviously it's different if you're, you know, I have talked to some therapists who are really trying to transition out of, you know, the grind of working yeah. 50 hours a week and they want to shift to this and there is the financial component. And that's what I've talked to them about of like, there's a reality to that, right? Like you need to sit down with your totally. family and figure out like what you need to be bringing in financially. That's a reality. But I will also say like, since I've been back in Colorado and I don't even know if I shared this with you yet, Laura, but so my OT career began in Colorado when I was doing adult brain injury and spinal mm. cord injury. And I really thought that that was going to be, I loved where I worked. It was an amazing place. I thought I would be there forever. And I mean, it broke my heart to be torn away from there because it was just this phenomenal place. Mm. Anyway, so now that I'm back here, um, the opportunity came up for me just to help out every now and then back there. And, you know, after a lot of prayer and thinking about it, I just decided like, that's something that I maybe want to do. So I'm doing two days, mm. a two days a month up there, which I love because it's a cute setting. And I feel like it really just like, pulls me out into a completely different setting and just kind of like shakes up my OT brain of like, yeah, a different challenge, you know, like it yeah. has been, been 15 years since I'd suctioned a trach, you know, like that is very, yeah. di that's a very different environment than what I'm doing. But I also want to say like two eight hour days up there, it has been very helpful for me to contrast. Like, I think it can be hard to get into this mindset of like the difficulties of entrepreneurship but it has highlighted for me all of the positives of entrepreneurship of what you said. Like mm. there's a lot of time 
that you're having to invest like, you know, outside the treatment sessions, you know, for my kids, like whether I'm doing home program boxes or those types of things. But as a, as a mom, a homeschooling mom, there's a lot of value in that for me of being able to do that at my home. If that makes sense. Like now that I'm experiencing going to work two days a week, eight hour days at a hospital away from my kids, like it has really highlighted the pros of entrepreneurship for me as a mom, if that makes sense. Yeah. Maybe that was a, just... flexi- a flexible work of like, even though you're working, you're like, you can be putting together those boxes at night with your kids there, yes. which I should say is another thing you should make a list of. Like that is like, people would buy that. People, therapists would buy that. Like get, get my list of 20 different home program boxes yeah, yeah, for nature-based oh. therapy, whatever. Like writing she's writing it down, y'all. She's writing it down. No, <laughs> I am. I, because, Laura, Laura's it's really, big. it's like, it's like, that's something that would be so easy for you to like put up on your website for not expensive, yeah. right? 10 bucks. But like people yep. would, people would buy that because then they can do it in their practice. Right. Because yep. I am, I am not like, it's hard for me to free up mental space to do that. There's, there's definitely a a different, this is some of my hesitancy with starting to see kids again. Cause I had been taking a break for doing my PhD and running my practice and moving cross country, you know, all the things. I, I um, <laughs> and, and I, I, you know, I thought about like going back, I've been an OT for like 22 years now. And I'm like, I want to, I think I want to start seeing a, a couple kids here yeah. in Wisconsin for therapy. And like, I started to realize like the thinking I have to do to run my businesses now is very different than planning a treatment session for a child and like that creative space of like thinking about what will engage the child and like thinking about creative things to do like if you can if you can kind of make that easy that's like what we try to do with like the treatment Mm -hmm. plans inside of the therapy in the great outdoors library and like all the stuff I have see I I forget I have these resources in my own business but like I'm like, I'm going to have to be thinking so hard. But what I'm saying is to create a list like that of like, here's 10 or 20 home program boxes that I've created in the past, that gives therapists such a, such a way to like serve their kids, the kids they're serving in a better way, but offloads that creative brain space that takes so much energy, you know, for us to think of the creative things to put in the box or whatever. That's, All you got to do is make the list. I don't think I you should start down. a subscription box company or anything like that. That's too much. <laughs> no, no, no. And I, but I do want to piggyback off that of another advantage of keeping it small, I will say mm-hmm. is because I pondered this a lot of higher price point, smaller quantity of kids. Right. So like, yeah. because I am spending a lot of time on, you know, yes. home program boxes, but my price point is higher, right. To pay me for my time that I'm putting into yeah. that, which is important. I've yeah. really grown in that of like keeping track of like, how much time am I actually spending on this? Because I want to be fairly compensated for that. I've, I've really yeah. grown in that because I think we all struggle with that as OTs of just wanting to do everything mm-hmm. for free. But with, with being small, I feel like that is a really good nugget just to take away of like, when you have a smaller quantity of children that you're seeing, yeah, making it more individualized, and then you have higher price points. So you're you're bringing in more income, even though you're seeing less kids, if that makes sense. Yes, totally. So I kind of wanted to end when you were like, it can be small, and it's all wonderful. And that's the, that's the perfect ending point. But then I have one more question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I just felt like that was so encouraging to people. So what do you do? And this might be another good one to kind of wrap things up. Like, what do you do or what do you think nature-based therapists can think about providing that that does really set apart the service to be worth paying cash for? So what are some of yeah. the, you've talked about a few of them, but I'm, I'm just thinking of a summary here if there's anything you haven't mentioned. No, I think that that's a great question because as I've been doing this longer, I've tried to be mindful of like mm-hmm. what I've tried to think about I've, I've kept it small. And my husband has said to me, like, not one person has said no, like not, you have not gotten one person who has said no, that has reached out to you and you've actually gone through the evaluation process. So mm-hmm. I've really thought about like, okay, that's true. So what is it about whatever I'm doing that is making that happen? Right. And so yeah. I think, I think a main one that I've taken away is my evaluation process. And when I say that, 
I've gotten feedback from families that the, my evaluation process of what I'm doing with the child and the information that I'm providing with the families and then sitting down with them and really talking through those evaluations. Yeah. They have loved that. And they, I have gotten feedback on multiple occasions of, because again, I've talked about these kids are kids who have been seen with other service models, right? Mm -hmm. And they will, the feedback that I always get is that they have never experienced someone take the time to sit down in length with them and really talk through the evaluation results. And so I will say that that's a big one. And not only that, but you know, I'm not just doing a portion of the Peabody or a portion of the bot, like, because a lot of times kids are coming to me and in the clinic, you might, the PT might be doing, you know, the gross motor side, right. Or in the OT doing the fine motor. And sometimes these kids are coming to me and right now they're not getting any services. Right. And so I'm doing the full evaluation of Mm -hmm. them. And if it's something like outside of my discipline, right like th- I need to refer them to PT, right? Of but like, course, yeah. I am really looking holistically at the child. I'm looking at cognition. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at gross motor skills. I'm looking at fine motor skills. I'm looking at the mental health side of things of like how they're yeah. truly operating. And so I think that that definitely is a piece families are valuing me seeing the child holistically as a whole and not just mm-hmm. a segment, not just their fine motor, right? Because that's a yeah. lot of times what happens, right? But I'm seeing them holistically and they feel like for the first time, someone is looking at their child as a whole child and not just a component. Does yeah. that make sense? I would say w- that would be my piece of advice for people wanting to step into this is your evaluation process has to be super intentional and take the time with families to really walk them through what you're seeing. And I feel like that's the piece that's the piece that's really getting them to sign up for services, right? Of them um, like Yeah. Yeah, like she spent so much time really making sure that we understood and that's someone we want. So I would say that piece. And then the individualized treatment programming. I feel like families have just really loved that and the pieces that I'm doing to make that happen is just very intentional communication. Like we're I use, you know, Loom and I use Google Classroom and it's Mm -hmm. not, families are not just feeling like they get this five minute recap where they're not really understanding what's happening, right? They're really feeling like for the first time they are involved in it and they understand what's happening. And so I would say that's another piece that would be absolutely vital for it to be successful. Yeah. And then in my, in my treatment packages, I also have the parent meetings, which I've gotten feedback that parents love that. They love, uh, parents are wanting that. When you're working with peds, I I can't Mm -hmm. stress that enough. I cannot stress that enough. So you're either doing one of two things. You're either doing a treatment session and not giving parents a good recap. You're giving them like five minutes and they're feeling like that's not enough. Or you're doing a treatment session and you're spending an additional 30 to 45 minutes after the treatment session right. recapping and giving them that and then not getting compensated for it, right? Or right. I am very intentional upfront with this is why I've designed it. And I tell families, like, I'll give you a session recap right after our sessions so you know what's going on. But like our communication will be through, you know, Google Classroom or whatever, talking about a recap. And then those parent meetings are really your time to just, I am at your disposal. Ask me any questions. Let's problem solve anything that you want. It can be anything you want. Like if it's a book you want to read or whatever it can be, like I am at your disposal. And parents have loved that piece of just feeling like they just need that support. They need that support. And I feel like that's vital to a treatment program. 75% of what you just talked about, anything that you just talked about that's outside of the direct treatment time is not reimbursable under insurance, right? That I think there's a lot of wisdom in this episode for for people who are thinking about, you know, selling cash-based services, like how you sell them to kind of highlight the benefits that you get of the of the more time, essentially. Like you get more time with the therapist on your, you know, thinking about your needs and your family. Yes. And communicating um, that with them. And also I feel like I'm doing an injustice if I don't say, cause I feel like I left this out. I have my basic program package and my complete. And I will say 
every single family has purchased the complete and that is my home program box complete package. And so I feel like I do need to say that because I would say that's the other piece that families have really enjoyed is talking what you just said about the creativity side. Imagine like you're saying that as an OT and you absolutely a hundred percent, if you got back into it, would be able to come up creatively with a home. Of course. Yeah. Totally. A hundred 20 years of practice. I could do it. (laughs) You could do it. You could do it. And I say that to OTs all the time. We neglect the fact that like, we literally have been doing this for our profession and we, it comes so easily to us. It does not come that easily to parents. It, it, Mm -hmm. It just doesn't. And it is, it is, a weight that is on them to be carrying out home programs at home. And quite honestly, we've talked about this. Like, I know what it's like to have kids. Like they have, they have other kids too. So yeah, giving them that home program box where they feel like it's an open and go and I can successfully carry out this home program has been, I really feel like a very integral piece to just it being a success. I would, I just wanted to add that in there because I didn't mention it and I feel like it's important. It definitely like sets the expectation for families that you're expecting them to do things at home, but you're going to give them what to do. And so it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a tangible, like thing, you know how everybody always wants to talk about like, what tech tools do you use? What EMR do you use? What da 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 da? Like everybody always wants. Yeah a system or a structure or a plan or a, a to-do list, you know, like we all like this checkbox kind of thing. It's like our brains crave that structure, I think psychologically as humans. Yes. And I really do. That's a wonderful point because I really do wonder if the, not just that it's a home program, but it's a home program box, box. you know, totally. like it's, it's like words matter. And like, it, it shifts something in your mind. When you say that it's like a tangible thing you're giving them, tell us a little, like just little, don't give away all your secrets, but just like, what do you put in those boxes so that people see that it's not like rocket science? It's, it's oh. not, you're very intentional with them, but it's, it's like you said, it's easy for us as OTs to come up with things, but maybe not as easy for families. So I want people to kind of hear what maybe you would put in a box. Don't give away all your secrets though. No, I won't. I mean, it, it's, they Cause you're going to sell I, this later. No. Yeah, I know. And I do want people to hear that they are truly individualized based on the child, like whatever goals okay. they're that's working important. on. It is important. Yep. And I, um, so that's why I can never do like a subscription box because I, cause I actually thought about that <laughs> earlier and I'm like, and there's OTs that are doing more subscription boxes, but that's not what's making this successful. It's making this successful as parents are seeing that it's individualized for their child. Exactly. And so they love that. And not only that, but the kids are motivated by the boxes, right? They get excited Mm -hmm. about they're opening their home program box. And for the first time, families are communicating that they're excited about doing their home program exercises. Brilliant. And that- Brilliant. And then they also know I'm doing, you know, most, I have do 10 sessions and I make sure that those are completed within three months time. And so they're getting one box a month, right? So they know that a new one's coming, right? And so they get excited about it. And it's kind of like this- it kind of rejuvenates them to be able to keep with the program. Like we got a new box, like we got some new activities. So it can be, honestly, I'm constantly like when I'm at stores or online, if something's like going on sale, like I'm like thinking like most recently I had a child who were really doing a lot of like reflex stuff and vision stuff and coordination stuff because we have kind of motor coordination stuff happening. And so Mm -hmm. I had, you know, i I put a metronome in there and I had a bunch of activities in there that he could do with a metronome with some like ball activities and some ring activities outside. I snatched up a, like a super cheap disc swing for one of my home that didn't fit in the box. Right. I had to put it on top of the box to give to the family, <laughs> I love um, it. but city, because we were, the child was really needs to work on upper extremity strength and holding on and even core strength, just sitting on the swing. And so that was part of my box. So it really varies. That's great. And and it's just really individualized for. Do they return? Do they get to keep whatever you give them? Oh, or do they, they get return? to keep. They, they, keep. they get to keep it. Okay. Yep. And so I've been, it's been a process of me really figuring out, like, I try to be mindful of like, okay, for this to be profitable, like, what do, what do I have right. to keep my boxes under as far as price range? Right. And that's still, I'm still kind of navigating that. I'm being very mm-hmm. mindful of what I'm doing as far as what I'm putting in there. And like I said, like, 
I'm like, my eyes are constantly like looking for like stuff on sale, yeah, yeah. Stuff to, even <laughs> at stuff at like Goodwill or like thrift stores. I'm constantly like jumping in there looking for, cause there's some good yeah. stuff in there sometimes that you can utilize. I got, oh, some cones. Yeah. I got, I got some cones for like 25 cents at the Goodwill that wh- I came up with a super creative activity to put in the home program box. Um, yeah. but you're taking that, that just off the parent's shoulders of them having to yeah. go on, get supplies and actually come up with the activities. It doesn't come as easily to them. And so, right. Yeah. We've, we've talked about that of just the importance of home program implementation and, Oh, one more thing regarding that, because we were talking about it. I don't know if you've ever read the book atomic habits, but yeah. So, you know, it talks about like, you know, starting small and, and I think it's like, I forget, how many day, days it is to build a habit? Is it like 30 days or something? I they say it's it like is. 30. I don't, I think you might've blown that out of the water in the book though. I can't remember if he's I forget the one what who it said. Is. That's but, actually not true. You know, like but whatever. we do know yeah. that it takes time to form new habits, right? Like yes. we know that and it takes consistency. And so I feel like that is what the home brought program boxes do for families too. Mm-hmm. It's like within these 10 sessions, like when we're thinking if I'm doing the 10 sessions within a three months time frame, that's like 90 days or less. Right. But if yeah. I can get the families to consistently do activities like this through a home program, like I'm building atomic habits into that family, like yeah. of actually doing the work at home. And so I feel like that more than anything is more is, is the most valuable asset of the home yeah. program boxes is that you're building this into their life. And you're building it into their routine that it's just something we do. And the child, like they just get like, this is just something I do on a daily basis. I choose an act. And I also do that. I tell families like they need to be doing all the activities, but give them choices. Like, and so they, there's that empowerment type thing of like, they get to pick something from the box and we're going to do this from the box. So the build, the building, the habits and kind of embedding it within their routine, I feel like is such a valuable skill that we can bring as OTs to these Mm -hmm. families. So I wanted to mention that as well. Yeah. And it's, it's something that I've been thinking about this a lot. I just shared on Instagram about this, that a lot of when we individualize things and when we like personal, when we personalize things for any of our clients, it's not quote unquote scalable, right? Like it's not something that scales. Like you can't, I mean, you could scale it as far as like you could teach therapists that work in your business to create these boxes, but but the profitability may break down, right? Because then you're paying therapists to create all the boxes yes. and you're paying for the stuff to yes. go in them and then you have to raise your prices and then maybe it becomes unfeasible to infeasible right. to do it. Unfeasible, infeasible, what's the word? Unfeasible. unfeasible. It's, it's like six <laughs> at night here and I'm like having had dinner. I shouldn't be recording a podcast <laughs> yeah. right now. I can't even form words. Yeah, anyway, awesome. But, but like, I think that the whole thing I talked about just, just yesterday on Instagram or this morning, again, can't remember. I was like, I remember the, seeing it. Yeah. These non-scalable things, the things that aren't scalable when your business is small, that is like a key to a successful business, you know, yes. it's like, is like that personal connection with people of letting people know you care. Like that is the foundation of a business. And yes, as you scale, some of those things aren't going to be possible anymore, but it's the foundation upon which your business was built. Right. And it it provided an awesome experience for the people that were there when you were small. Right. I was, I, I was like writing messages to people in the business coaching program in the hive. And I was like, wait, if I get like 20 people enrolled next time, like there's 12 right now. So it was feasible, right? To write everything and like send everybody a thing in the mail. I'm like 20, 30, like how many of these could I do? I mean, I guess I could spread it out over, (laughs) over weeks of time writing notes. And, but I just think, you know, for right now, it's like, yeah, these people have full on access to me. Like I I'm available because there's only 12 of them, you know? So it's small. I totally agree with the mastermind and, people. And I life. saw when you put, po- I actually saw that you did that. And I thought to myself, so something I do for families who end up signing for a package, I have found at Walmart, these like super cheap, like carabiner mugs that said adventure awaits literally at Walmart. And I was like, that yeah. is so cute. And I like bought them all out. And I was like, and I literally, so when they, when they set up for a package, I put a little note inside that little, that little, it's like a stainless steel carabiner mug a note to the child and maybe something else in there. Like I might 
like for some of the little girls, I like sometimes put like hair bands in there. Cause then I tell them like, yeah. you're going to have to, you want to have your hair back. Cause we're going to be doing lots of super awesome fun out thing, things outdoors. But it's, it made me think of that when you said that it's the little things that just like that, that are, you know, creative and show them that like it's individualized and you personally care for them. And yeah. I, I agree a hundred percent with what you said of like, I can do it right now on a small scale and, and that's okay. Like, I don't have to think about down the road if Later. I can't do it anymore. Right. <laughs> like it's, it's working right now. It works right now for totally. me. Totally. And I'm, I can do it. And so I can change trajectories down the road if it's not working anymore. So. Yeah. So great. Oh my gosh. There, I could talk to you for like another hour, I but I, I think probably I've already taken way too much of your time. Cause it's no, I always love talking 15. to you. It's yes, I know we've so been, fun. we've been on here much longer. Cause we even waited to hit record for a while. <laughs> this happens frequently y'all. I will um be chatting with a guest before we hit record. And then I'm like, wait, wait, everything we're saying needs to be recorded. Let's hit record now and have this conversation again. So I know and it was we that really should too. though. It would be fun, Laura, to maybe do like a follow on one. Cause we did hit some good stuff about transitioning of locations and the things to just mm-hmm. like, keep in mind. We talked about like, you know, your state laws and making sure that. Oh yeah. We didn't even so hit on that. Oh my didn't. gosh. But I, I think it could be a whole other kind of podcast, just like as you transition, as you move, if, if that's kind of your transient life, like just the things to be aware of, of things that you need to be looking into. And cause I, I definitely have learned some things along the way that we can definitely share at another time, but yeah. Just be aware of your state laws. That is what, yeah. Check, yes. check your new state. Cause it might not be the same as your old state. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> On that boring legal note, we will end this podcast. I know. <laughs> I know you can just cut that out. Cut that out. That was boring. No, no, we're not going to, we're not going to cut it out. I, this was a fabulous, very valuable conversation for people, Kim. And I am so thankful to you for taking time. Like truly, I I find you such a gift to our community and I'm so thankful for you and for you making time to be here and like share all your awesome wisdom with people. And well, yeah, Laura, I, I appreciate you. It was seriously, I've told you this before, but it was me on my treadmill listening to one of your early podcasts, just about like fail learns and just doing it that really like pushed me into just going ahead and doing it. So you have done so much for this community of just like inspiring others to step out into it. So I love you and adore small you. Steps. So, yes, small, small steps. Yes. Small Small steps make great gains over yes. time. I haven't said that on this podcast. Maybe I have <laughs> on, that was the, it's true. The, out, the outro to my old podcast. So, but it's true. I, I, I think about it all the time. Like the small steps, like almost everything you do in business and in life. Like if you just think about it, like small steps, you can do yes. it. You know, it's like it's it's amazing how far you can go when you just kind of the small steps over time. So, yes. and you are an illustration of that, Kim, just how much you've done. It's so awesome. So thank, thank you, you for Laura. being here. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for spending time with me today, exploring therapy in the great outdoors. If you liked what you heard in this episode, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes so we can share the magic of nature-based therapy with a wider audience of therapists who work with children, children who desperately need connection to nature nowadays, just like we do. If you're ready to take the next step in this adventure, join our free Therapy in the Great Outdoors community at therapyinthegreatoutdoors.com. The Tego community is a private space just for nature-based pediatric practitioners. We have loads of resources there to support you as you start or grow a nature-based practice or program. Our free Tego community has a discussion forum, a jobs and volunteers board, a crowdsourced treatment activities section, as well as free video trainings, research article reviews, and book recommendations from yours truly. Head on over to therapyinthegreatoutdoors.com to join today. So until next time, get outside, connect, reflect, and enjoy the business and practice of therapy in the great outdoors. 